welcome to the Runners World podcast with me, Rick Pearson. And me, Ben Hobson. Today we're speaking with Alex Dowsett about running and haemophilia. Speedy man on a bike. Is he speedy running? Probably, yeah. Yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, you know a bit more about him, don't you? I was, as a as a sort of running purist, his <laughs> yeah. name is not one that I was super familiar with. Obviously, I'm interested in the haemophilia angle because that's, um, that's an interesting way of kind of how to overcome that. But, you, you, you know, you have been a fan of him for a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've followed his career, um, being a cycling fan, and so it's great to talk to him, um, and to yeah find out the transition from bike to running, and and tying in with haemophilia and the uh, possible risks, dangers, no risks, dangers. However, it goes. But yeah, it's uh, he's a very very speedy man. So you know whether or not he's translated the on bike speed to the road, we'll see. We'll see. Hey, look, bit of science for you, Ben. Great. Um, so. Did a bit of proper journalism with this, so um, I spoke with um, Emil Caress, who is now the British uh, ten mile record holder, um, and he's he running is. London as well. He's exciting, isn't he? Like you feel yeah. like he, he's going to be having a good crack at all the British road records. I think over sort of from five k. I, I like marathon, the fact so. he went for this this the ten mile first. Like it's such a it's such a like well it's a classic. First of all, it's a very long standing record, isn't it? Well, it was yeah, ni- uh, nineteen eighty three. Richard Nureka has set the record. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, so it's, it's very very old. It's very yeah. old. Very old. Um, I am older than that record. Only just so. Uh, <laughs> no, it's ninety three. Anyway, it's 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 old. It's yeah, yeah. Old it's, one. It's, it's one of the longest standing ones. And also, as you say, a true classic distance, the ten mile. Yeah. So yeah, beat, yeah, I think he beat it by about five seconds, didn't he? Um, so he'll be working his way around some some records, I reckon. So, but so, yeah, so he he's talking sense, right? We can we can all agree, I think, listeners, that a man who's running forty five minutes for ten miles is training right. Mm-hmm. So I spoke with him, and he's he, we, I talked a little bit about strength and conditioning, and actually we're going to speak we're going to get him on the podcast proper to go through this. But um, and he said, oh yeah, I I'm I spoke with a guy called uh, or he heard Richard Blagrove, who is. He's almost like the sort of foremost strength and conditioning expert in the UK, particularly from, with a running focus. Mm-hmm. And he was speaking on another podcast. They do exist uh, called the Adap- called the Adaptive Zone. So shout out to the Adaptive Zone for this one. Um, but uh, yeah, and he said essentially there are seven um, exercises that runners sh- should do. Um, and other than that, he was he was much more like these are actually great core exercises. So you can do these, and we don't need to be adding in like loads of planks or side planks or, or like glute bridges Th- these things are kind of if you that, you're going to cover like 90 percent of what you need to do with these just seven exercises so oh. pretty um quite a nice sell isn't it you kind of think okay cool so we can all we can all do seven exercises we can all do seven exercises oh. um so there is a talk about a squat type movement such as a, a front squat or a back squat if you've got a, a barbell um, yep a hip hinge movement pattern, such as a Romanian deadlift or a deadlift from the ground. Yes, good. Um, a stepping movement pattern, such as a sort of dumbbell step up. So kind of stepping up onto a box, but with some dumbbells in your hand. Yeah. Um, he was actually a big fan of doing one uh, dumbbell in hand. So put, if, say, for instance, if you're stepping up your right foot, you'd be holding the dumbbell in your left hand and that would just give you that kind of trunk work just nice. to kind of keep your, your balance. Um, this is good. A lunge pattern, and his his uh, recommendation was the split squat, which is just something to work to Google if you're not totally familiar with a split squat. But I I think actually not a split squat, uh, Squ- yeah, split squat, um, a split squat, a split lunge or a split squat. It's called a split squat, but it's it's sort of the middle ground between lunging and squatting. And I, I, to be honest, I think that he would, I think that a squat, a lunge of any like a backwards lunge or a forwards lunge would would kind of fill that, tick that box. Nice. Um, uh, number five was a loaded single leg calf raise or a calf press hold on a leg press if you're in if you're yeah. in the gym okay um, that's good and then just a couple of upper body things which are just classic ones so pull-ups on a on a bar uh and uh standard standard press-ups for number seven um and he said if you really want a golden star for number eight you can do some dead bunk exercises oh i like again, those don't, yeah that's uh, good oh mate so, so there you go um reps wise 10 to 12 if you're a novice if you're if you're really into this stuff you can start varying the reps um you know lifting heavier so you can only do maybe four you know reps of each of those um and then go back up to 10 or whatever but he was a big fan of sort of 10 to 12 but no, no certainly no more than 15 otherwise you're getting into something else Different. which isn't really building uh, strength in the same way yeah <laughs> kind of so yeah, yeah there you go quite useful um i'll put those exercises in the show notes so people can can read them as well i'm gonna them, read but- that I always need to, I always feel like 
I need extra guidance on this sort of stuff because I do the same sort of things over and over and I know that that's good for maintaining but sometimes it's nice to have variation to, to sort of learn whether or not you've got an instability or a, a, you know a weakness somewhere because you can if you train the same thing over and over those things will get strong but the other bits would become neglected so it's kind of like the step up is a good one because actually driving up through the leg is very it's very good for running power like that's a good it's a good one but as you say you need that hip pelvis muscle core stability to make sure you're not sort of throwing a hip out as you drive the leg up yeah and stuff like that. all that stuff so it's um yeah i really like it and it, just say as far as how many times you have to do it he said twice a week's great mm. um twice a week's great once a week's probably not gonna give you enough and three times a week's brilliant but not a lot of people have the time to to do that um also if you i mean realistically going through this is probably going to take your best part of 40 minutes um but the other way you could do it is if you just can't do that you could do 10 or 15 minutes a day just you, the idea would be that you get your volume to the same as if you were just doing right. so you might do you ones. might do like uh three sets of just the like the first two yeah oh, totally yeah exactly nice yeah, that i makes like more that sense for you yeah, yeah that's which good is, um yeah uh, so yeah, that's it. Anyway, so look, bit just a bit use, just a bit useful. Um, I love that you've just you, yeah, bit. just dished out a nice little handy start. You know, introduction. Here's some here's some stuff to get on with, guys. Don't stop yeah. listening. Just FYI, <laughs> yeah. do the please go listen go to this listen, whole yeah. thing and then go and do your exercise. That's important. Yeah, yeah good. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, look, let's go on our guest of the week. Let's do it. Guest of the week. Here in the studio. Guest of the week. Sometimes on the phone. Alex Dalsit, welcome to the Runners Well podcast. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. So, this is, you know, we've just, just been chatting briefly before we started recording, and you've done a few cycling podcasts, and but this is the first running one. So, I'm really happy that we get to, you know, to, to, to break that uh, break that barrier for you is this new career that I think is coming uh, as this pro pro runner that we've got. <laughs> pro um, runner, that's, that's ambitious. <laughs> can you <laughs> can you give us a quick overview, um, just for everyone, just to tell you a bit about yourself, um, your cycling career, and, and how you got into the position of training for a marathon? So um, I've been cycling for um, I think I picked up racing when I was 13, 14. 14. Um, time trialing was, is, and will be my love within cycling. You know, the, um, a, a stage race would be a bunch of bunch races uh, for me to get to the time trial. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I've had you know, good success. I think the you know, cycling is a, is a team sport where a lot of riders that are um, – uh, good domestics never have the opportunity to get success for themselves. Whereas as a time trialist, every time it was, I, I did the team thing in the bunch races. Um, and then as soon as it was TT day, everyone gets their own opportunity. And, and thankfully I was, um, it was my specialty. So I racked up uh, a good solid amount of rims. I think a, a pro career that most, um, most pros would be proud of. Uh, Cup two grand tour stage wins, Commonwealth gold and silver medal. And, and, um, an hour record of success and a failure at an hour record. Um, so six times national, six times national champ. Come on, six, yeah, six, yeah. yeah, six times national champ, and um, yeah, I think that's uh, that, that. Yeah, that probably bookends it all. Um, those are the highlights. The highlights that people would have heard of. You can cycling is one of those things where you can win an obscure race in the back end of France and, and it's a big deal in the cycling world but it doesn't doesn't carry much weight anywhere <laughs> yeah. else <laughs> it's better than um, Ben and I isn't it I was going to say what four, four foot Peckham Rye Park run that's as good as it's got for me it's <laughs> pretty actually well done yeah. I've had a top good. ten at the park run um, oh there you go oh, oh yeah there we go the one and only um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you, have you so I mean I'm quite interested to hear how because you're a time trial specialist and it's an individual pursuit, you know, you're, you, you, you race as a team and you've had great success as a, as a team rider, but the time trial is very much an individual thing and running very much lends itself to that. Uh, I thought I would be better at it than I was. Um, yeah. I won't lie that the, in time trialing, the one thing I can do extremely well is, uh, pacing. Um, 
and it's I cannot seem to crack it with running. It is a horrible, horrible experience trying to pace a run. Um, and it, it's amazing how it hits you in different ways. Like a TT, I'll know after a minute and a half if I've, if I've got it wrong. Um, and then you'll know again at five minutes if you've got it wrong. In a run, you find out quite a bit later. Um, and, there doesn't, and, there, and there is almost nothing. Well, that's where the similarities come back. By that point, there's almost nothing you can do about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I was um, you know, humbled a little bit by you know, as soon as I was trying to do anything longer than 5K, um, it was it became a big, big challenge. But I, I ran in school, um, and I, I know we're going to talk about my hemophilia, but I ran um, and I, I swam a lot because of my hemophilia. And then when I picked up running in school, or I had to do the obligatory cross country and, and 1500 and 3000 meters, I um, I found after I was swimming for a swim club team, I ended up becoming um, one of the quicker runners in my in my year at school, and and yeah, sort of would be, um, but I discovered the difference between uh, one of my um, colleagues who was just a naturally gifted runner, and then there was me who was just fit, and he would usually get the better of me. Um, until yeah. the tipping point where his lifestyle got the better of him yeah. and I ran by him. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and, I, and then that, that's kind of where the running stopped. And, and basically the reason we're doing the London Marathon, my partner and I, um, is uh, the minute I knew I was retiring, we saw it's it's the biggest opportunity to raise money for charity. Um, and... Yeah, we both love a challenge. We come at it from very different angles, but we both love a challenge. And and, and I, I won't lie if we're probably going to talk about triathlon at some point in the next <laughs> oh, half oh, hour, 45 cool. minutes. Um, there you go. Yeah. Can, can we talk then a little bit about haemophilia, Alex? Because it's probably a condition that um, some people will be aware of, but I think it's worth just giving a quick overview of what, of what it is and also the potential issues of a haemophiliac playing sport. Yeah, so in a nutshell, there are 13 steps to your blood forming a clot, like coagulating, um, whether that be internally or externally. Um, I don't have the eighth one. There's different forms of haemophilia. We can have different numbers. Um, yeah, I don't have the eighth one. I have it as bad as you can get. It's, it's a rare disease. Uh, it affects 99% of the time. It affects only men because of the way it's carried on the, on the genome. Um, and... Yeah, without medication, I bleed. Um, internally is the main problem into joints, into muscles. Um, that is all managed with medication now. It has been since I was um, 12. Prior to that, it was it's always been managed with medication. But prior to that, um, now the medica- since I was 12, the medication is proactive. So it's to I have it regularly to stop me having bleeding episodes. Before that, it was reactive. So I'd, I'd have a bleeding episode, which... Um, into a joint would be the most common one and often feel like um, it'd feel like a bone break. Uh, you wouldn't be able to move. Um, there'd be a lot of pain. And then, but the medication, sort of, you then have medication, it dissipates it over time. Um, the one thing I don't talk about, it probably is relevant here because it's affected my running journey a little bit, is um, if you like the joint capsule is not made to have blood in it. Um, and it can quite aggressively attack the cartilage. So I have in an elbow, uh, which that is as much as it straightens, that's as much as it bends compared to the other one. Um, similar issue in an ankle, in my right ankle. Um, and yeah, it's, sort of, it's, it's basically arthritis, um, but it shouldn't, as long as it's medication, it shouldn't get worse. And I think that's where cycling has been great for it because of... Uh, there's been no impact on that joint. You know, it's a very fluid motion. Um, so, and that's where running has been a bit more of a challenge because it's like the, not just on the joint, but actually just on my overall body. The impact is just mind blowing how it much it well kicks the crap out of you. Basically, um, you know, I could do twenty minute run and it feels like I feel as wrecked as I would do after a four and five, four or five hour bike ride. It's it was uh, staggering. 
Yeah. Was there were there any like genuine medical concerns or procedures that you had to to take into account when you took on this challenge? Was it did you know that the medis that your medication that you currently have would be suitable for you know upping the impact that you're putting through joints and stuff like that? Yeah, I was confident. I was confident I'd be okay. I mean. Uh, the thing is, haemophilia has uh, gone through a massive change in basically since from just before I was born. I was super fortunate to be born when I was. Um, before then, there wasn't really much in the way of medication. There's been a horrible, um, if you Google it, you'll quickly find links to HIV and hepatitis, which is because prior to the synthetic medication that was made, uh, haemophiliacs were treated with concentrated blood transfusions to, to give them the clotting factor that they lacked. It wasn't super effective, but a lot of there was, there was a massive um, ordeal um, scandal where a lot of the donated blood was was for, was infected with HIV and hepatitis. So a bunch of haemophiliacs then contracted that, you know, as if things weren't bad enough. Thankfully, I missed that. Um, and subsequently, it's been a massive um, culture shift in haemophiliacs and in, in Kind of, I was one of the first to start being able to explore what we were actually truly capable of, um, and uh, we've, you know, it's come so far, and, and we've certainly, you know, the, the doctors when I was young were very much like, you know, swimming because it's low impact. What what the doctors did know is being fit and healthy was was um, crucial. Less weight on the joints, strong muscles, strong joints um, were less susceptible to bleeding alongside the medication. So, um, and when we we talked about running, we talked about because I wanted to do sport, I wanted to be active. Um, and he said, "Yeah, running's. Uh, we think running might be okay, but it's the impact that we're worried about the constant, um, yeah, the constant impact." So um, they were, you know, the cycling's not without its risks. Um, but I think they were more receptive to the motion of cycling than um, than running. Um, but you know, and here we are, sort of fifteen years later, where I know a lot more of what my body can be put through. Um, and subsequently, I'm uh, yeah, I'm confident. So long as I've had my medication, which is an intravenous injection every second day, um, I will be capable of just for want of a better expression, made sure I am not running before I can walk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, yeah, yeah. When you were going up, like, did you have people try and put limits on you and say, look, it's actually, you want to, you want to complete an elite level, level sport. That's actually unrealistic for someone with hemophilia. That can't be done. And if that was the case, how did you kind of keep, keep on believing in that dream? Because that, for me, feels like it would require huge amounts of, of self-belief. Um, I think... So there's two things that, yes, there was always a no list and there kind of still is. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that involved sports in school, uh, football, rugby. Football's more on the table now than it used to be. I think the, 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 the message, the thing is with football, because you know, a lot of British kids want to play football. The thing is, it's like you, you can play it now, at like eight, nine years old, where you, you're sort of, I don't know, you weigh 30 kilos, 30, 40 kilos, and you know, everything's quite light. But what happens when you get to like 15, 16, the tackles are harder, the impact's harder. And, it, and it's like, what's better? Do you say no to a kid when they're eight or nine? Or do you say no to a kid when they're 15, 16 and actually they've discovered they love it, they have a talent for it? And sure. Yeah. And whatnot. So, so um, my parents were probably the, they handled, um, I, I'm, I'm a father now and are taking a lot of more inspiration now from the way they raised me. Um, than I perhaps did back then. And they were very much, look, we can't do this. There's just, there's no sugar coating. We can't do this, but let's go try this instead. Um, so they found more hemophilia friendly sports for me. Um, and I think and another thing that happened was you did, you develop a, a prove people wrong mentality. You know, you get all these no's and you're like, uh, and, and like, we see it like, with their charity. Kids either go and do it anyway, or, they sort of go and do something else, but the the, the over overriding message is, hey, I'm going to go and prove to you what I can do because I'm getting all I'm just hearing all of these no's, and I'm going to go show them. And that that was me. I was like, I'm not gonna. 
I knew I wanted to be very good at something. Um, I just didn't quite know what it was. So the other thing is I'm, I've always been um, a small uh, a small goals guy. Um, I, when As soon as I took up cycling, realized I had a talent for it. I wasn't like, right, I want to win the Tour de France. It was like, I want to, like, next week, I want to go and try and improve that time by a little bit, a, a little bit and a little bit. And I'm gonna, I want to beat that person. I want to like try and win that race. And then comes a point, okay, well, actually, I, it's realistic that I could win nationals. So that's now my goal. And then oh, it's realistic that I could be good internationally. So that's my goal. And it was always that little like step by step. Um, I never said that like winning the Tour de France or Olympics or, or something. It was just like, yeah, that'd be nice. But that is so far away. I can't. I, I just struggled to picture the pathway to get there and, and it, it it just seemed too far. And I was, yeah, like I said, I was just a small goals guy. That's how I worked. Well. And I think it was, yeah, ended up going pro and achieving like success. So I was like, huh, like, <laughs> we ended up with it. Um, so uh, I think that that's how I was quite fortunate in that, how that happened. Because I imagine that when we sat down with the doctors and said I'd taken up competitive cycling, it was probably a good thing that I just said we'd taken up competitive cycling and not with the aim to win the Tour de France. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, their response to we've taken up competitive cycling is we'd rather you play chess or a musical instrument. But if that's what you want to do, like we'll support it. Um, yeah, it might have had a different answer to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'd say that the taking on the marathon isn't such a small goal. That seems like that's quite a that's quite a leap. But I guess with the motivation behind it being to raise money and awareness is. It kind of makes it more of a more of a feasible thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I think like a marathon, the marathon distance is quite a common cycling distance. Um, and I've always we do twenty five mile, twenty five, twenty six mile TTs all the time. I I held for a, a year the British record for the twenty five mile TT, um, and I I always thought it would be quite unfathomable anyone running that distance um but also this was the the last time i ran anything was a three thousand meter race in school so i yeah there there was a common theme within cycling where you you don't run you just do not run anywhere and that that that's that's shifted i'd say in the last three or four years where a lot of cyclists are using running as cross training um but um no I, i think once i um, got my head round sort of yeah running then it became I was like okay this is, uh, it is still it's a very long way I, I equate it to a six or a seven hour bike ride um, and but it, it's I think it's with I know it's within my um, scope of physical ability just from an aerobic stance I think it's just it's actually more my body um, yeah muscles joints all that kind of thing just keeping keeping going with it because it is a very different um it's very just just very different to cycling and i'm i'm cycling comes very naturally to me and, and yeah running do, do you have a do you have a goal alex for the, for the marathon other than getting round is it hard for you to turn off the kind of competitive spirit yeah i i, I did i think it's a little bit unrealistic uh now i had a goal of sub three hours um yeah but I think that's a push. I think that's a big push. Um, I, I I think I could get round in under four hours pretty comfortably. Um, I think just based on fitness and and a half, like a half decent amount of running. I've I've been I've had quite a few injuries. I'd love to tell you they're running related, but I also took up skiing this winter. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, retirement you've just gone all in on the non cycling approved sort of yeah. like thing. Ski, yeah. Skiing, running, all the stuff. Yeah, basically, I, I um, we're very for, we we live in uh, Andorra for now. We are moving back. Andorra's it has been like a cycling. Um, haven um, it is horrendous for running like it's, <laughs> it's just it's altitude and high and and just all uphill there's no flat or there's, there's no that, flat. there's no there's no yeah. flat at all um, we have to drive it's an hour and a half round trip to drive to a flat trail um, wow. <laughs> yeah and that, and that takes some like plan it, we, we have to leave it's in Spain like we have to go to another yeah. country to run 
um, <laughs> on the flat. So we've got a we've got a kind of a two, a five kilometer, six kilometer out and back, which is not flat, but it is as flat as we can get. Um, and then yeah, then there's the altitude at play as well. Um, yeah, we live at yeah we're running at sort of six, 17, 1800 meters. We live at two thousand. Um, so yeah, that that's been tough. And then also like, skiing's on our doorstep. Um, taking up that sport hurt myself. Oh, well, you'll reap the benefits. Yeah, I tell you what, you, you'll get you'll get down to flat London, <laughs> sea level London, and you'll be absolutely flying. You'll be fine. I, I hope. I, I mean, I hope. There's, I'm, I'm counting on that, and I'm. We move back. Um, I'll basically have three and a half weeks at sea level before the marathon and i'm counting on cramming quite a bit into there um yeah so so i don't i don't know if um i don't know if sub three is i don't think sub three is achievable um but i will yeah i'll give it a good go this is the runner's world podcast me and Ben were asked him before he came on. Maybe you're going to ask it now, Ben. But like, just about tech, obviously technology has come into running a bit more, certainly in terms of shoes, uh, but probably is still trailing behind cycling. I'd say that's fair, Ben. What do you think? Yeah, I wanted to ask, like, for for someone of, of your uh, interest in aerodynamics, running must be an absolute nightmare. All that frontal exposure and stuff. When you, you know, is there <laughs> anything that you want to, uh, you know, how would how what can running do to be more aero? I think is what you know. <laughs> I mean, flappy, flappy anything for a start. Yes. And that's just real, like, that's basic. Um, the, yeah, it's just anything that's flapping is, is unnecessary drag. Um, Speed suits, that's what we need. We need some yeah, sort of, basically. yeah. yeah. I, I mean, our yeah. running vests for um, Marathon are made by my bike sponsor. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, yeah and um is it the shoe technology I yeah are you in the sh- are you in the super shoes oh yeah it's one of the first things i did not just because <laughs> um not it was 270 pounds which yeah yeah and then i turned up to park run in them which i don't think is a done thing um you got to win really. at that point you got to come yeah, first it's, it's a real park statement run, let's not get into it yeah the bright orange ones as well i couldn't find like a oh, nice yeah. black yeah, yeah. um yeah, yeah, yeah but um yeah, I, I, um, so I have spent an enormous amount of money on a skin suit to eke out a few percent um, to try and go faster. Like we're we're talking multiple thousands of pounds for a like one skin suit um, to gain five, on the bike. This on is on the bike. Yeah, yeah to gain five yeah, percent. Yeah. And I walked into the night store, and I was like, "Those are the shoes that." Uh, Kipchoge wears like those. Those are the shoes. I know a few different brands now make a like, similar thing, and they cost two hundred and seventy pounds. Like I have bought the pinnacle of like, go faster <laughs> anything yeah, yeah. for two hundred and seventy pounds. Like I might buy two pairs because that's like, <laughs> like a See, that's that. I think I yeah. think that's really interesting. Yeah, because like a lot of people, and I think we've real you know absolutely fair enough. Think think money's got too expensive, and I think. There's definitely a shout for that because the technology going into shoes compared to the technology going into a carbon bike is quite a lot less. But it's still a cheap sport in comparison to other sports such as cycling, I think. So it's quite interesting to hear that that view. Yeah, massively. And and I, so I noticed it at the, at the park run I did, the Maldon Park Run. A few people commented on the shoes. And I, I was sat there. And I'm like, it's only because I've come from... Like if, I, if I'd been a runner all of my life, I'd have probably balked at the idea that yeah. a pair of yeah. trainers cost two and a half times what a pair of running trainers should cost. Um, and, and and that was sort of the the, the general um, reception I got from the park run with them. It was like, oh, you're wearing these shoes to a park run. And I was like, why would you not? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Was, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, and... and so yes, yeah, it's, it's very much come from the, um, I think because of the sport I've come from. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's been... And also your 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 direct interest in progressing things like that, that pinnacle stuff, as you're saying, like no one can walk into uh, you know a cycling shop and bike shop and pick up off a rail a skin suit that you will have 
you know the the, the 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 crossover isn't the same really whereas as you say the world's fastest time for a marathon you can go and pick up the shoes oh that's Just, interesting that's interesting mate i didn't realize that yeah yeah so it's it's, it's it's yeah i mean my, my skin suits were uh like the the most expensive one they made uh, twice i've had a 3d printed me made um in my bike position so that they that can go in a wind tunnel and everything can be like placed like different depending on speed depending on um air density so whether you're at out racing altitude or sea level seam placement um different depending on whether you're indoors on the track so your wind's only coming at you or more or less straight on or if you're outdoors and more susceptible to crosswinds all of that is factored in to making these skin suits and overshoes and then that's just the suit you're not talking then about helmet bike wheels tires like tire pressures there's there's it's so much and it all except for the air that you put on your tires it all costs money like it's um yeah yeah right uh, and then is yeah it, it's just it's running kind of just running the simplicity of it does that really appeal to you now then yeah i mean it's definitely easier to get out the door um and it get like rocking up to the park run was was a piece of cake um it's it's my only competitive running um experience so far um i i won't lie i i i get my sort of yeah we have a very common expression in cycling which is marginal gains and i get my marginal gains head on and i'm sort of trying to think about where my feet are land that like going and sort of the stride and then um that nutrition um I got laughed at on social media because I was like, I don't know where runners put all their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. Well, yeah. I mean, um, just simple things like phone. But I was like, where, does, where do runners put all their nutrition? And I got like the few runners that followed me laughed. They're like, oh, you're thinking like a cyclist. Don't need any of that. You just go and run. Yeah. Like, well, you don't I mean, for the longer run, so you you know, yeah. that's you've got to factor that in. You've got to go well, and get yourself uh, yeah, I, some I, shorts, some some race shorts with built in built in pockets, yeah. pockets and yeah. and loops and things. Yeah, yeah. It's... The, the amount of people though were like, you just go and run. And I was like, so you don't take any nutrition? And they're like, no. Nah. I was like, and everyone talks about hitting a wall in a marathon. Yeah, it's because they're not uh, eating. I'm like, <laughs> My cycling head is saying there's something, something's adding up here, but I, I, can't. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, because you know, I think that nutrition is a, something that a lot of amateur runners really struggle with, and, and you know, with, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of information out there about grams per kilo of body weight and how often you're having it, and 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 all those sorts of things. And as you know, as someone who's come from uh, a, a sport where you spend all day on a bike for three weeks at uh, three weeks on you know when if you're doing the grand tours you're out there every single day for hours on end um you know the nutrition side of stuff is kind of inbuilt in your in how you train and how you would exercise right yeah i mean you, you when it all goes wrong you fall off a cliff like you just i think i think if in cycling it's much easier to feel that point um where it is very much nutrition based i think running for me so far, when I've overcooked it, that's just simply because I'm running at a pace that I can't sustain. I don't think that's a fueling thing at that point. Um, I think that would come a little bit later. Um, so perhaps it's that lack of feeling that in runners. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. I think there's there's some stuff that... So bowel movements have been an issue for me running. That's something I do not experience when I'm cycling. And... I immediately, I was like, well, I think there might be a solution for this. Um, so for cycling, for big um, big targets that require a significant amount of elevation gain, um, we, three or four days before, take on what's called a low residue diet. Um, it's very dull. Uh, lots of white rice, white chicken, white, just white, white bread, white everything, not a single color, basically like zero fiber. Um, after a couple of days, it clears you, clears you out. So there's just not much in there that can come out. And um, you end up dropping. For cycling, you end up, it's like that last kilo you can drop um, on race day. It's not sustainable You want because it's so un... Um, there's, there's very little in the way of nutrients in there. So you, you just do it for a specific day um, within a race or, or something. So and I thought maybe that could be a solution for the for the running issues 
Can you can you tell us a little bit about your charity, Little Bleeders? And obviously you're, you're raising money for them and awareness for them through London, but it'd be nice to hear a little bit about what their kind of the mission statement is. Yeah, so we, um, Little Bleeders focuses on uh, the young haemophiliacs, like the new generation of haemophiliacs. And, and so the underlying thing is using my story that we can we can achieve more than um, we thought possible. And it's not, it's not necessarily to say that everyone can go on to be a professional athlete because it's not for everyone. But it's, it's kind of, I think the most powerful question I've answered is, is a mother of a haemophiliac asked what my team does when I crash. And I, I, the short answer is if I can carry on, I will. And if I can't, then I probably need to go to hospital. And then the team said, so basically, like, um, not like, uh, sort of treat you as, as anyone else on the team. And I said, yeah, I said, the hospital's going to panic a bit more when I arrive. But um Ultimately, yeah. And and this man was like, okay, well, if, if you're being treated like that in what is actually quite a dangerous environment, why should my son be treated any differently in school? That's a pretty valid point. Um, that said, though, you know, with what we've said about rugby, there is um, concessions to to be made. And, and it's about help. So Little Bleeders is about helping parents um, and haemophiliacs navigate that and, and opening their eyes to um, the po- a positive haemophilia story because i think you certainly when you're going through the diagnosis journeys the the responsibility of the hospitals the consultants and the nurses to arm you with worst case scenario and it's like well i I found myself in a position where i can offer a a, a pretty bloody good scenario so our yeah our big thing is to is to move more and, and be more um and i think our major our major um uh, initiative that we're doing is the sports fund which is yeah in line with cost of living crisis recently and and like ongoing we saw a lot of a lot of families had to so unfortunately with the with the fact that school sc- school sports are amongst the sort of the sports that haemophiliacs would struggle um to do long term we want to help provide some financial to support support to families to take their haemophiliacs to some extracurricular activities. Um, and it's a, it's kind of every term. So three times a year, there's a round of, a round of, uh, you know, a round of sort of handing out these grants. Um, and they can be anything, dance classes, sailing lessons, um, a family bought a stand up paddle board because they live next to a lake, just anything to help um, mobilize uh, that haemophiliac and, and, you know, help support them in, in these extracurricular activities, which are a bit more, a bit more haemophilia friendly. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, I mean, I can tell you from a very personal anecdotal point of view of an old colleague of mine, he, when his, he's got four kids now, I think, but his first son was born. Um, he, his son was diagnosed with haemophilia and I knew of you and because of through cycling and I knew of little bleeders and it was the, I think during, as you say, the diagnosis process, he was quite, well completely was sort of shocked and had no idea what what he was going to do and how to approach it and it was very uh it was very good i think he found took encouragement from me pointing him your your direction and what little bleeders was doing because it as as a father of a new kid and and the kid had hemophilia and he didn't know much about it and i think it was immediately a positive benchmark of being able to see someone who has the, the, the same condition but was achieving things and you know what I mean it's, it's very much that visibility of success when as you say the the the, the, the nurses and the doctors are always going to be delivering worst case scenario in that sort of situation yes yeah I mean my, my what my parents went through at times it was all encouraged to speak to other parents of haemophiliacs and it became a bit of a sort of who could share the worst stories um and they ended up they just didn't they were like we'll we'll find our own path i think they were like we don't we don't need the doctors have told us what we need to know we don't need this additional negativity yeah we'll we'll, we'll make our own way yeah that's great yeah very best of luck alex on that yeah. london marathon i hope you can do the sub three obviously <laughs> you've that's... got aer- aerobically you you you'll be you know easily capable of doing that but it's as you say it's a different sport different challenges yes and, uh, yeah. yeah, you've got the right shoes though. So you do have the right shoes. That. Yeah, bright orange. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not missing them. Although <laughs> just, I'd just imagine the first... it won't be the I won't be the only one in them. 
Yeah, oh no, not at all. <laughs> no, you'll be, you'll, the, the, it's a wash with neon expensive shoes. You'll be, you'll, you'll yeah. be absolutely, yeah. Uh, you'll look yeah. the part, be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yes, half the battle. <laughs> yeah. Thanks um, a lot for, for your time, yeah. yeah. No, thank you very much for having me. So that brings us to the end of this week's Runs World podcast. Thanks very much to our guest, Alex Dowsett, and to you, of course, for listening. You can once again subscribe to Three Issues of Runners World for just £5. Head to hearstmagazines.co.uk slash Runners World Podcast to get this exclusive listener offer. But also, while you're there, you could probably just have a little click around and find the full subscription to the magazine and just do that instead. But, you know, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to you. Um, Thank you for listening to the Runners World Podcast. We do very much appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Thanks for listening.